Genesis chapter 29, or, or if you've got a phone, that's great. It's also in your bulletin. Uh, as you see, it's, it's a rather lengthy passage, but it, it is one chunk. Uh, so starting at the end of 29, going through chapter 30, uh, verse 24, and Bobby is going to be reading for us. Good morning. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, for now my husband will love me. She conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I am hated, he has given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. Again she conceived and bore a son and said, Now this time my husband will be attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore his name was called Levi. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, This time I will praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah. Then she ceased bearing. When Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister, and she said to Jacob, Give me children, or I shall die. Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel, and he said, Am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? Then she said, Here's my servant Billah. Go into her so that she may give birth on my behalf, that even I may have children through her. So she gave him her servant Billa as a wife, and Jacob went into her. And Billa conceived and bore Jacob a son. Then Rachel said, God has judged me and has also heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore she called his name Dan. Rachel's servant, Billah, conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, With mighty wrestlings I have wrestled with my sister and have prevailed. So she called his name Nephalti. When Leah saw that she had ceased bearing children, she took her servant Zilpah and gave her to Joseph as a wife. Then Leah's son Zilpah bore Jacob a son, and Leah said, Good fortune has come, so she called his name Gad. Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a second son, and Leah said, Happy am I, for women have called me happy, so she called his name Asher. In the days of the wheat harvest, Reuben went and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, Please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, Is it a matter that you have taken away my husband? Would you take away my son's mandrakes also? Rachel said, Then he may lie with you tonight in exchange for your son's mandrakes. When Jacob came from the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, You must come in to me, for I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. So he lay with her that night, and God listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob, a fifth son. Leah said, God has given me my wages because I gave my servant to my husband. So she called his name Ishkar. And Leah conceived again, and she bore Jacob a a sixth son. Then Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will honor me because I have borne him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun. Afterwards, she bore a daughter and called her name Dinah. Then God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb. She conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph saying, May the Lord add to me another son. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Thanks so much. I uh, just ask you to pray with me. Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you that uh, it, your word is different than what we might expect to find. Your love is different than anything that we can expect to find in this world. And we pray that you would just lift us up in how good it is, Lord, that, that you are God and you are so different in so many ways um, than our human nature and, and the world that we live in. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, so we in a series in the life of Jacob uh, and just kind of been moving through his life. Last week, we, we covered the um, sort of a, a fateful wedding um, exchange where, where Jacob ends up marrying uh, two sisters in the course of one week. Uh, and now we kind of move forward into uh, seeing well, well, just how well that domestic bliss is going for everyone involved uh, in that. Um, you know, there's a, a classic from the 1920s, The Great Gatsby. Uh, and, and in this, there's the main character, Gatsby, as you might guess. Uh, and, and he's a very mysterious, very wealthy guy. Uh, and part of the mystery around him is actually how he became so wealthy, because he kind of just shows up one day and just kind of out of the blue, he buys this enormous, luxurious mansion on Long Island. Uh, and as you read through, it comes out as part of his story that, that Gatsby has done everything. His entire life has been built on, centered around the, this one purpose of trying to get back and, and rekindle the love relationship, the romantic interest he had from, from his youth with this woman, Daisy. And uh, you find out as it goes through this, this relationship basically fell apart during World War I, he, he left during the war to make something of himself uh, because he realized pretty early on as he's engaged in this relationship with her, with Daisy, he, he Gatsby, was going to have to become something very, very different. Right? That in order to win her and especially her family's respect and affection, he was going to have to become uh, a very high society, high cultured, and very, very wealthy guy. And he's, he, he wasn't that. So he sets about his entire life to become that, and he does this. Uh, he, he, he learns right through, and he picks up all of these lessons on how to become this high society and cultured guy, and he gets into this uh, illegal business of bootlegging and a lot of other illegal ventures in order to amass this huge fortune, and, and then he, he does all of this to move in across the bay from Daisy. And then he throws these elaborate, giant, very expensive parties all in order to try to get her attention, to try to get her interest back. Right? In her part, right, she has very much moved on with her life. She's been engaged. She's married. She has a kid. Right? But, but Gatsby is believing if he does all of these things, if he becomes all of these things, right, everything that he's going to orchestrate is going to work. And of course, the, the tragedy of this story is that it doesn't. After everything that he does, everything that he becomes in his life, it, it's not sufficient to get her interest. And that's really the tragedy that is at the center of this story. I and mean, we see it primarily in the person of Leah, uh, but we see it get played out for Rachel as well. And, and a lot of the disappointments and frustrations that she goes through and, and the pain that she feels. Both of these women, both of these sisters, pour out their heart and their soul trying to earn this status, earn this love, earn this recognition in Jacob's eyes. Right? And neither of them ever really feel they've gotten it. They've ever really gotten enough of, of what they're looking for. And the main point from us is to praise God because his love is different. Praise the Lord, his love is different than this. As we go through here, what, what really is another, another bittersweet chapter in Jacob's life, uh, we're going to see first, and spend the most time on this, is how God works in the lives of people who are trapped in dysfunction. Because that's a big part of what's happening. 
All right, and then we're going to look at uh, God's lessons for Rachel and God's lessons for us out of that, and then we'll finish with God's lessons for Leah and, and the lessons that are the same for us. And, and before we get into all this, I, I think it is worth talking about why when we read, when we hear a passage like this, it's probably going to leave a bit of a bad taste in our mouth. <laughs> Uh, and, and the reason for that isn't because there's nothing good, there's nothing redemptive happening in this. The reason is that uh, passages like this, uh, there's a lot of really messed up stuff going on. Uh, particularly, I think, that, that strike against, um, for us, I think, as modern hearers with modern sensibilities, we can hear passages like this and, and respond in the wrong way. Because we, we get really offended by this kind of stuff, right? and get really turned off. Uh, by these kind of passages, especially these kind of passages in the Old Testament. I mean, you, you look at what's happening here, and, you know, he, here is this, you know, incredibly rigidly patriarchal system. Women have virtually zero value, right, except for their looks, their appearance, their ability to bear children. Uh, and, and then here you have this great kind of hero of the Bible, Jacob, and, and he, he's carrying on with multiple women, right, and, and he, he's not treating any of them really the way that he should, and there's a few things I think we need to, to say or to think about in, in response to that feeling, that, that reaction. And, and the first is you may remember, if you've been part of this series, the theme of this, this series is that God redeems and uses flawed people. Flawed people. All right? and, and so although Jacob is a hero in the sense that he is the focal recipient in these stories of God's grace, Jacob is a very flawed person who makes a lot of mistakes, like we all do. The second thing that I think that we should note that, that's worth considering is that perhaps uh, we should not be quite so arrogant, uh, quite so proud of uh, our, our modern 21st century American culture. You know, I mean, just ask yourself, well, how far, how far have we transcended a, as a culture? How far have we evolved and developed as a culture to come to a place where women are no longer valued on their looks or their relational worth or, or, uh, or that men are no val valued on their wealth and their power? Uh, so, you know, perhaps worth thinking about that. Uh, and, and last thing I think worth saying is that, uh, and this is something we should be very, very grateful for, and that is that the Bible is really honest. <laughs> the Bible doesn't whitewash life. It presents life in full color with all of its grittiness, all of its, its messiness. And, and this is really a tremendous blessing because we never have to come to the Bible and think, well, does this have anything to say to me? Does this have anything to say to my life? Or, or do I need to really become a much more you know, spiritual person, really be, clean up my life a lot more, and then I can appreciate these great high spiritual truths? And no, the Bible meets us in the midst of our lives, in the midst of our, our, our problems, and God urges us to invite Him into the mess and the, and the tangled just dysfunction of our lives. And, and I think that we need to understand, we read stories like this, the Bible is not condoning what is happening here. Right? There's a very different message the Bible has. In fact, if you ever wanted a primer, if you ever wanted a case study for uh, why is polygamy a bad idea, uh, why is having multiple partners a bad idea, uh, you don't have to look any farther than this. By, by the end of this story, Jacob ends up with four wives, and, and you can see how well that's going for Jacob. So, uh, we, we get this picture in the Bible of the, there is a presentation of why this dysfunction is not part of God's plan. Right? And we can see here as well why this kind of treatment of women also goes against God's design. Because you can see, you pick up here that from the beginning, Leah and Rachel ha have been taught right, by the way that they are treated by Laban, their father, that they are instrumental goods. They're instrumental goods. 
meaning that they have worth to their father strictly according to the financial advantage or lack of financial advantage that they bring to him, and that's it. And both of these women learn this lesson very well. They internalize it very deeply. And you can see this in the way that both of these women are married off. Here's Leah is kind of pawned off. She's shuffled off in the dead of night through this deceptive act because Laban doesn't think he can get anybody to marry her. He doesn't want to get stuck with her. Or he's got to get her off his hands. And then meanwhile, for Rachel, he's sort of thinking, well, you know, here's maybe a way I can, I can squeeze a little bit more value, get a little more bang for my buck. I get seven more years out of Rachel here. All right? And you can see that this is a snapshot of clearly how these women have been viewed, how they've been treated by their father their entire life. Right? And, and the final outcome here is that everyone loses in this story. Everyone loses. Right? This, kinda, this, this wedding deal, right? this swap, Leah for Rachel, it's one of those just infamous, infamously, unbelievably bad deals. Right? Instead of being win-win, it is actually lose, 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 lose. <laughs> everyone loses in this. Rachel is losing, Leah is losing, Jacob is losing. The only one who appears to be winning is Laban. Right? But then later on in the story, Jacob and Rachel and Leah have all very much figured out the kind of guy that Laban is, and they don't want anything to do with him. Right? So they, they all leave. And so actually what Laban is doing on, on this kind of fateful wedding night is, is he is sowing the seeds for him to lose both his daughters his son-in-law, and all of his grandchildren. He's going to lose all of that. All right? And so very clearly we can see that this kind of selfish, instrumental treatment of women, or any relationship for that matter, it is not part of God's design for human flourishing. And it is also precisely this. It, it is their instrumentalized view of their worth that both women are going to have to spend their entire lives working through this, right? bringing this before God, hearing what God has to say about this. Because Rachel and Leah, and, and this is also, by the way, this is also what we are going to have to work through in our lives, our whole lives. Rachel and Leah are very used to being treated and loved and valued by what they can offer. What can they bring to the table? And so early on, this is their looks. It's their beauty and attractiveness. And then later on, it becomes well, how many children, specifically male children, can they have for Jacob? Because that's how they're going to build up the family. That's gonna, they're going to add strength to this family name by having male sons. And so it is this instrumental value. Right? And each of us, we are hardwired to think in these same terms. I mean, chances are, my guess, is that you don't view uh, your worth primarily as far as how many male children you're going to have. Probably. All right? But, right, each of us have our own sort of terms of value that we lay over ourselves. Right? There's something that we've picked up from our culture, something that our family has given us something that you have picked up from someone that you respect. Right? And, and this is something that you feel this tremendous weight, or you feel this tremendous insecurity that whatever value it is that you aspire to, that you will be weighed in the balances and found wanting. Right? We, we all have this, this something Right? That, that we hold over our heads and say to ourselves, if you don't do X, if you don't become X, right, you fill in the blank, what are you doing with your life? What are you doing? And for Rachel and Leah, this X is having sons. Right? It, it consumes them. It, it just drives them all the time. This is, this is all that they can care about. It, and what happens, of course, is that when your worth is instrumentalized like that, 
It's going to breed this terrible spirit of of division and envy and desperation. And, And what's interesting, I think, is that our world actually does a really good job of pushing back against that. Our world actually does a really pretty good job of recognizing, hey, that's a problem, right? This this instrumentalizing of your worth. And so, you know, that's where we'll get these these messages of you know, love yourself and you know you are worth it and you are enough. And those are actually the right kind of messages. However, our world has zero, I mean literally zero grounds to give you that message. But the Bible does. The Bible says that you have value. Why? Because you are made by God. In His image. And you have special worth. You have special significance to Him. Right? And you are meant by God to bear His image and, and show His love and reflect His goodness to the world around you. That, that is your value given to you. And the Bible, the Bible also speaks honestly to us about our shame. And the solution to our shame in Jesus. And it is the solution that, that Rachel finally finds out at the end of this whole passage. She says, verse 23, in the very end, God has taken away my reproach. God has taken away my reproach. Right? And that is what Jesus does for us. Whether there are things that you are ashamed of because there are standards that the world has put on you that you aren't going to reach, that you're never going to reach, or whether there are things that you are ashamed of because you should be ashamed of them. Either way, Jesus has taken away your reproach. That's it. When you trust in Jesus, when you connect yourself to Jesus, there's no more reason for shame. There's no more reason for you ever to hang your head because your worth is no longer based on what you do or fail to do. Your worth is entirely based on Jesus. And His goodness just given, just given to you. The last thing that's worth noting before we we move on kind of from this dysfunctional family setting and all the problems here, it's it's worth, it's been worth spending all this time, I think, digging into this because there is an important lesson that comes out from this, and it seems like every chapter in Jacob's life, right? And and so you see all this dysfunctional, problematic patterns, right? Here they are, that there's Rachel and Leah and um, they're, they're both in this competition. They're both trying to get Jacob. And they both end up using and their, their servants. They sacrifice more of Jacob's heart to their servants in order to try to win in this having sons competition. Right? And yet, in all of this that's happening, again, God is bringing about good purposes. God is going to do really good, really powerful redemptive things through these terrible circumstances. And this is an important lesson. Our lives are never too tangled up and and knotted and dysfunctional for God not to be able to do good and wonderful things in your life, through your life, if you're able to see how God is, is drawing you closer to Him through those things. So let's look very briefly at Rachel now and, uh, and the lessons that God wants to teach her, and then we'll, we'll close by looking at Leah. And really, Rachel and Leah, essentially, they have to learn the same lesson, and that is God's love is different. It is different from this instrumentalized, conditional way that they are accustomed to either earning or not earning love. And they are going to have to learn this lesson from opposite directions. Because Rachel, for her part, Rachel is the golden child. She's the favorite. She's the pretty one. She's the popular one. She's the one that that everybody likes. And and things always seem to go well for her. And and things always just kind of fall in her lap. So the question for Rachel then is, what do you do 
when things aren't just falling in your lap anymore? What do you do when somebody else is now getting the recognition and, and the accolades and respect that you are used to getting? Right? So the lesson for Rachel and for us is that God's love is different. That God loves her and us only on the condition of Jesus. And that means that there is an unconditional, an unconditional love if you're trusting in Jesus. And this is the only kind of love that it would it has the ability to break Rachel free from this cycle of frustration that she's stuck in. You can see this, just one example, verse 8. Here, verse 8 is after she has used her servant in order to get her children. This is an unfortunate family tradition. Uh, and she says, With mighty wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister, and I have prevailed. And then you see very quickly after that, that that wasn't really the case. Because shortly after she says that, we find her bargaining with her sister and things that shouldn't be bargained with. Jacob, this is another unfortunate family practice. In exchange for these mandrakes, which mandrakes thought to help with fertility. So, clearly, she doesn't feel like she's prevailed. She still feels the shame. She still feels inferior. She still feels reproach. And this is what always happens when you are in a competitive and striving position in life. That even when you are winning, it won't feel like you're winning. And it's not going to last for very long. And Rachel is going to have to go through very deep, very long-lasting disappointment in order to discover Jacob's love is not what she should be building her life on. You look back up to chapter 30, verse 1, and Rachel, she, she's just so frustrated at this situation, she lashes out at Jacob, right? And she says, give me children or I die. We should be reminiscent here of Esau and the stew. And, and Jacob, he actually reads this reaction exactly right. He, he kind of he hits the nail on the head here because Jacob says, am I in the place of God? Am I in the place of God? And you see, that was precisely the problem. That both Rachel and Leah have put Jacob and his love in the place of God. And, and I can tell you that... Um, for those of you who are married, if you're wanting to be married, whenever you do that, whenever a husband or a wife puts their spouse in the place of God, everyone loses. Everyone loses. Because your spouse isn't meant to hold up to those expectations. Only God is. And I think this is really particularly challenging in our day and age, because romantic love right, is one of the last and highest gods that we have in, in our society. Right? That this idea of if I find romantic fulfillment in just the right partner, just the right person, this, this person is going to make me feel completely happy and whole and, and satisfied. That, that if I find just this right one, they're going to meet the deepest longings of my heart. And then we wonder why there's so many divorces. So many people who can't commit to marriage because there's so much of a burden on it. Let's move on to Leah. Lessons that God wants to teach Leah. And I think that these verses actually that chart Leah's births and her reactions to these births are really among the saddest in the Bible. As we see a portrait here of a woman who has felt inferior her entire life. She's felt less than her whole life. Can you imagine, just try to imagine being Leah. 
You've you grown up in your younger sister's shadow your entire life. Right? Always the person that, that everybody loves and praises. Right? And here, finally, at a time that you should be breaking free, Right? You should be setting out on your own. You should be leaving the past behind and, and becoming your own person in your own world. You marry the guy who's been in love with your sister for the past seven years. And you get one week, one week with this guy before, guess who, shows back up, marries your husband. And you spend the rest of your life again in her shadow. Right, but, it, but it's in all of this, this terrible, heartbreaking situation, that God wants Leah to learn that his love is different. It's not like the love or the respect of Laban or Jacob or anybody else. That Leah is not going to earn God's love. She can't earn God's love. God's love is just there. He delights in her. He loves her. He cherishes her. He blesses her. And it has nothing to do with whether Leah is succeeding or not. It doesn't even have to do with whether Leah is keeping God in the right place, as he keeps blessing her after she messes up. But what happens here is, and as we see this, right, both Rachel and Leah, they go through this cycle in this chapter right, where they have a son, where their servant has a son, and then they have this one-line reaction. Right, and so for Leah, this is what happens for her first three sons. She says, number one, the Lord has looked on my affliction. Now my husband will love me. Then the second one, the Lord has heard that I'm still hated. And the third time, now, this time, surely my husband will be attached to me because I've borne him three sons. Now you can just hear the desperation. You can just hear those deep scars of hurt and disappointment as she has thought time after time after time by proving herself, by demonstrating irrefutably her, her level of instrumental worth that she will be able to earn Jacob's love. And it never happens. And then finally she has this, this fourth son, Judah, who, by the way, Jesus comes from. I think that's not insignificant. Jesus comes from the line of Judah. And, and it's as if something finally clicks for Leah. She, she finally gets something about who God is because she says, this time, this time, I'll praise the Lord. And man, you so badly want it to end there for Leah. That's where you want the story to finish. Her grace, she's got it all wrapped up. She's got this figured out. Finally, finally she's realized who God is and, and it's come together and she's just going to have this great joy and contentment now the rest of her life. Uh, just so often that's not how life works. This is really what I want to close with because Leah, she, she ends up going right back to this idea of earning with her later sons. She says that now God has given her her wages, and maybe now at last Jacob will honor her and love her. Now, so often this is how it works in the Christian life. Right? God works on our spirit. Right? He brings us to this place where we just come to the end of ourselves and realize what I'm doing is not going to work. It's never going to work to earn me the love and the recognition that I want. And so what I've, I've just got to receive it. That's all this. I've just got to receive that in Jesus, it's just freely given for nothing. I, I'm never going to earn that. And that lesson can break through really powerfully, right? And can kind of just cut the legs out of our self-reliance where we finally realize, nope, I'm, I'm never going to have anything except what God just freely chooses to give me. And then slowly, subtly, 
imperceptibly, this attitude of earning just, just comes right back in, just creeps right back in the back door. And I think it's very natural, actually, because it's a drift towards, this is how the whole rest of the world works. It's all earning. And just like Leah, we all want something. We want something that's going to set us apart. Some sphere of life that I can win in. I can be the best in. So that we can look at ourselves and think, you know, I might not have the looks, but I've got the brains. Or, I've got the money and the connections. Or, um, you know, well, I've got the experience and the skill. Or, well, at least I'm somebody who knows how to be a good friend. I really understand how to be a good friend to somebody. Or, hey, at least, at least I'm somebody who knows how to have fun. I know how to have fun in my life. And what we're all doing is just trying to carve out this niche nor we can demonstrate and prove our value and our worth. And God has to keep teaching us over and over and over that it's not going to work. That our value comes from simply belonging to Him. That's it. That being loved by God is all we have because he just decided to love us. Praise God, His love is different. It is different from anything else we will ever have in this world. Let's pray that we can just learn that, hold on to that. <clears throat> Father, we thank You that in many ways it is so hard to understand your love, because it is just so great. It, it's just so different. We don't have a category for someone that would love us like you love us in the way that you love us. Just, just freely of your own decision, of your own grace, without anything that we can do or anything we can add or anything we can build. That your love is there and it is only on the condition of Jesus. We pray that we would have a deeper security and hope and confidence and joy in that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.